and I would be worried about online education for the less self-motivated, for the less talented. Hi, this is Dr. Jed McConisco, and I'm here with a good guy who I've been reading his book, and I feel like I've really gotten to know him, Professor Stuart Roystatcher. And uh, we're not going to talk about his book on this interview. We're going to talk about some of his ideas about education, and in particular, this new thing called online education. So, Professor Roystatcher, tell us what you think about this and how it plays into the education of the masses in the United States. Well, it's less expensive. So less expensive is good. And it allows for more flexibility. So for people who are actively working, raising their kids, we live in a very, uh, uh, the lifestyle is, ch is changed where we're no longer doing one thing at a time. Everyone is multi-processing, right? Multitasking. It allows for people to squirrel away small amounts of time to study in a convenient place, their home. So there are lots of big advantages, expense and flexibility that mean that it's going to always be a force in education, in particular higher education from here on in. And so as you wrote about the, uh, you know, higher education experienced a golden age, and now we're sort of in this sort of stationary phase. If you think about it as bacterial growth, you know, sort of we're just kind of chugging along now. Um, how does how does online education play into uh, that end of the golden age and, you know, the tightening of belts and all that stuff? So it, it offers an opportunity to for education, either for intellectual achievement or for career advancement, for a group of people that have the initiative to participate in an online way. Uh, I would say that not everybody is able to do that. Not everyone can find that just, they just don't have the mindset to, and self, the ability to be self starters to go online, let's say an hour a day, or maybe even an hour every other day, and then spend an hour every other day studying without some sort of physical presence. Uh, but for a select group of people who have that initiative, it provides them with a path that they may not have otherwise, because it is an expensive relative to physical education, uh, physically being in a pre in a place which has all that bricks and mortar and is inefficient inherently from an economic standpoint and it provides them the flexibility where they don't have to travel somewhere. So it saves them money and it can save them time for a select group of people. And not everyone is able to do this effectively. You have to be honest and, and people have to do self-assessment. Am I the kind of person who can do this on my own without knowing that I'm going to embarrass someone if I don't, right? You know, so and uh, one one aspect of physical, physically being at a place is that you get to know people and the cost is high. So the ante into the system is high and the potential for embarrassment is high. You know, you don't want to disappoint people. You, you're sitting in a dorm, you, want, you don't want to disappoint your fellow dorm mates by failing or doing poorly. You don't want to disappoint the professor or the instructor. You know, you have some sort of relationship. You go, oh, that person is there. I don't want to disappoint them. You don't have that ante, that high ante in online education. So only a select group is going to be have that ability to not worry about embarrassment, right? And just be, have the initiative to say, I'm going to do this on my own, right? Mm -hmm. And then for them, it can be highly valuable. Yeah, that, Very that makes valuable. a lot of sense. Now, yeah. on, the, on the flip side, for higher education, as it has to, you know, sort of deal with the fact that, hey, we're not getting government grants as much anymore. And, you know, alumni donors have carried us a little bit further than we might have gone. Uh, but, you know, everything's got to end at some point. Is online education a way to shore up some of the weaknesses that you pointed out in your book? Or... Um, is there is there some lesson that we can learn about online education? I think it can be a supplement, uh, and, and you know, for example, for for the for the self starter, for the highly motivated. You know, I I note that just from personal experience, uh, a good friend of mine's daughter is going to a law school, a highly regarded law school, 
and during this pandemic time has had to do all her work online just about for most of her three two last two years and these are highly motivated people with undergraduate degrees that are off the charts in terms of their GPA and the recommendations and have ILSATs. Can they do this? You bet, all right, you bet. So it provides an avenue during this time of pandemic for uh, a top-notch law school to still function pretty well, you know? And so has she suffered because of this? A bit because of the social aspect, right? And getting to know people and getting to know context, but far less than I would have imagined, right? Far less than I would imagine. And because it's been the first time that these schools have done this, it's been an expensive proposition. So you can say that, okay, they still charge an arm and a leg, but maybe they had to, to make this transition. But in the future, it may be that those top-notch schools will be able to do an online format at a lower cost, it may be for these highly motivated, highly talented people who are going to law school, who are going to MBA programs, who are maybe even going to medical school, which is outrageously expensive because states have withdrawn support and aren't subsidizing it the way they once did. So for these top-notch students, it may well be a way of providing a lower cost education uh, which will be beneficial to them, right? Mm -hmm. Beneficial to them. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So as we close out this interview, um, you would say that maybe even the top notch schools can lower their, you know, the, the, the costs that they have to spend, the buildings that they have to keep up, this and that, while maybe even increasing their enrollment. Uh, I mean, people have been talking about how, you know, Stanford, Harvard, these places should clone themselves because they sort of have a de facto monopoly on, you know, the top schools in the nation. Um, so how do you see online playing into that whole discussion? Yeah, so I would say that those schools are the ones that are best equipped to handle online education, but they already, because they already tend to get highly motivated students. And I would be worried about online education for the less self-motivated for the less talented and uh, i would say that for those students who are not used to having that sort of initiative that the community college system which is still inexpensive is the way to go for those first two years and and that though there are many students that still need that hands-on care still need to be face to face with people and I'm not trying to deride them, okay? This is just an emotional kind of thing that some people just don't have that ability. And I think the community college system, which is still inexpensive across the nation and is highly uh, unappreciated for reasons that I do not understand, okay? I do not understand. It provides a tremendous value to this country. Uh, it should be the way that it's done and less in an online way uh, for, for particularly for people who are just starting out in education, who's, you know, this is their first, they're the first generation to go to school, so they don't have their parents as sort of guides. Uh, it's a cost efficient way, probably better for them than online education. So if I had to think about where to put eggs in a basket, I would say for people who are, who are just starting out in this education system, they have no history in their families of starting out and want to save money, then the community college system, getting your first two years done in the community college, then going to four-year school. After that, save a lot of money, learn how the system works is the best way. For the highly motivated, then you can start, start looking at these top-notch schools and saying, why don't you do more online education? Because you can, you don't have to increase your bricks and mortar, which are expensive. You don't have to increase your physical plant. A lot of these schools are located uh, in regions where they can't expand anymore. I don't know about Wake. How big can Wake get? Wake could get a lot bigger, but I'm thinking of the places where my kids are. And yes, it would be hard for them to right. get more so space. It would seem to be you could rotate people in and out, keep the same physical plant, rotate people things in and out not uh, don't hire me to do this by the way that's beyond my expertise but uh rotate people in and out so the physical plant doesn't have to be bigger people can spend some time 
getting to know people at college and then a lot of time outside. And you could probably dramatically increase the enrollment at all of these top 100 schools that all these students seem to funnel into. They only want to go to those top 100. It would alleviate the problem of uh, too many applications for too few spaces, which right now has gotten to levels that are not good. You know, it creates this tension that people shouldn't feel. So yeah. that that's how I, I that view makes higher education. Yeah, that, that yeah, makes a lot of sense. And, and, and for the schools that are not currently in the top 100 that, you know, are then going to lose students to the top 100 if they expand the way you were talking about and, you know, lose students to the community college system if they follow your advice and, and go with a cheaper option their first two years. They're obviously not going to be able to survive, especially now that the golden age is over. So would you just recommend that they sort of take their name and their, you know, their alumni and sort of just pool together into different groups? Or what, what would you say to, uh, you know, the, the people at those uh, less than top 100 schools? That are, yeah, if the school does thing. not, yeah, if the school does not have a large endowment and is somehow viewed as, you know, out of this top 100 or top 200, they're going to have a hard road ahead, and mm -hmm. and I, I I don't predict a good future for many of these small colleges that played a significant role in education in the United States for a couple hundred years. Uh, nothing lasts forever, and okay. so uh, for those schools, I, I don't see them having much of a future. And and they can consolidate, like for example. There are there's one school in the northeast that just consolidated with an Oakland uh, small school, mm -hmm. so they're going to be bi coastal, yep, uh, and that. maybe that makes it more attractive. But I, I, in the long term, unless some school has a large endowment and can subsidize their tuition, uh, there they become less and less attractive because everyone wants to go to these, not everyone, but most people seem to want to go to some school that has a visibility and a ranking system, rightly mm -hmm. or wrongly. Now, I could say that those small schools can provide an excellent education, and they do, all right? But unfortunately, people aren't listening to me on that matter, right? So, <laughs> you know, so you I'm, just one, I'm just one guy, all right? Yeah. And, and I notice that my ideas don't necessarily carry the day, right? Okay. <laughs> I well, don't understand I've, it. I don't understand it, but I've my enjoyed, ideas don't carry the day, okay? Yeah, I've enjoyed <laughs> listening to your ideas. I think you were uh, maybe 10 years ahead of yourself, uh, ahead of the game, and it was fun to read even 20 years later, 25 years later, what you had written in the late 1990s, because I think it is going on still today. And And one analogy you made is that People have stayed at the craps table too long. You know, they were doing great, but they should have quit while they were ahead. What, how does that analogy play into these small uh, schools that aren't in the top 100, top 200? What could they have done differently? I mean, I mean, the writing might have been on the wall 25 years ago, but what could they have done differently? Uh, they should have chased after money big time to get big endowments. Because if you have a big endowment, first of all, you have people with a vested interest, family with a vested interest, important families with a vested interest in keeping you going. Second of all, you can use that endowment, not that everyone does this, to dramatically decrease their tuition to create value. You can say, okay, you could go to school X, but you can go to my school, same education, and pay $10,000 less per year. So you could work on the idea that you are a value school, but mm -hmm. you can't be a value school if you don't have the endowment, the endowment to cushion you. So what they yeah. should have done you know, and I was mumbling to myself as I watched these schools struggle along is try to find somebody to give them a hundred million dollars, you know, at a clip, even though that's a difficult ask, uh, it, that's how you survive in this game is by the size of your endowment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at uh, Liberty University, not that I, I want to tout it as a great university, but you know, it now has an over a $1 billion endowment. You know, I think it's 1.7 billion, last I checked. They were on the rocks as a school. They were financially in precarious situation. Somebody went after money, chased after it, got it. Now you can imagine Liberty, even though it's not, I don't think it's a top 100 school, it's, it has a niche, right? Religious education and highly endowed. 
It can probably keep its tuition relatively low because of its endowment. Uh, and it can keep going for a long time. So mm -hmm. endowment would have been the key for these schools. So if they're sitting on $56 million or $200 million endowments, uh, the right handwriting is on the wall. Okay. So, and maybe they can find somebody in the next five, 10 years to keep them afloat, right? Then that may mm -hmm. be possible. But I think a lot of them are gonna be gone in another 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they will have represented a different era in higher education and they will have done an outstanding job, mm -hmm. but their time has come and gone. No, no you know, not, ev not every university or like some of the heralded universities in Europe, they don't exist for, you know, 700, 800 years, you know, not, not every, in the United States, we're not gonna have too many Utrechts, okay? <laughs> yeah, I don't know when Utrecht was founded, but a long time yes. ago. Yes. Or 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 uh, Bologna, you know, uh, yeah, founded right. a long time ago. Long right? time ago. Uh, yeah, right. We're and, not going to have. That's okay. I mean, it's okay. I, that, I that... don't think there's anything wrong with that. Okay, mm -hmm. personally, you know, every dog has its day. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, let us thank you again for your thank wonderful you. time, Stuart. It was great.